So we're going to move on to our next innovation. And this innovation is in pacemaker and ICD therapy for children by Dr. Charles Barul at Children's National Hospital in our nation's capital of Washington, DC. Let's watch. Hi, I'm Charlie Barul from Children's National. And I'm gonna to talk today briefly on what's new in pacemakers and defibrillators and can it be applied to children? As we know, most devices are not designed for children right now, as you see from these three examples, this small premature infant with a temporary pacemaker that's bigger than him, the beautiful ballerina with a resynchronization pacemaker that you can see in her belly, and this little baby who got a regular pacemaker, but because of his size was too small to get it transvenously and had to have an open chest to place the pacemaker. The two standard ways to put pacemakers in children include the transvenous approach and we see this extra loop of lead to allow slack for the child to grow. Uh, and, uh, and then the epicardial approach here where the pacing leads are sewn onto the outside of the heart, which is relatively simple other than having to open the chest to be able to get to the heart. And then the generator is placed down here in the belly. But sometimes you have to be creative and do things that are off label. Some of the exciting things that have come out in the past few years include leadless pacemakers. And there's two that are currently being utilized, uh, the Medtronic Micra and the Abbott Nanostim. And you see them they, here, they, they look pretty similar and their delivery systems are quite similar. When this was first reported in the New England Journal about five years ago, you see the delivery sheath and catheter to place this leadless pacemaker as it undocks from the station uh, into the apex of the right ventricle. And on the X-ray, you see the whole pacemaker sitting there inside the heart. Shortly thereafter, Medtronic published their multi-center study also in the New England Journal. And as you see, they look almost uh, identical. There's some different ways that they hook on and they uh, dock and undock from the delivery system, but they're pretty similar looking. There's not much data though in pediatrics or adult congenital heart disease, just a few case reports. Here's our first case that my colleague, Dr. Libby Sherwin uh, performed in an eight-year-old child who needed pacing. And you can see in her heart, the, uh, the small leadless pacemaker sitting in the right ventricle. Published reports include one from uh, this group in Israel. Uh, they had an insertable loop monitor that documented a long pause, sinus arrest here where the heart stops beating for six seconds or so associated with, with syncope or fainting. And so they implanted a leadless pacemaker. And what I like about this picture is look at the relative size of the insertable loop monitor that's just sitting under the skin in the chest and the leadless pacemaker that's sitting in the apex of the right ventricle. They look uh, really the same. Here's another novel uh, issue is here's a teenage pregnant girl who uh, has a six second period of asystole associated with fainting. And so we needed to implant a pacemaker. And usually when we do transvenous pacing, we typically use x-ray, but we didn't want to do that in this uh, pregnant patient. And so we took the three-dimensional mapping system that we typically utilize for uh, catheter ablation and other electrophysiology procedures, hooked up a couple of alligator clips to the pacing lead. And you see the lead as it's moving through the heart, goes through the vein, uh, then into the right atrium, and now up in the, in the right ventricle here, moving around, trying to find a place down in the uh, lower part of the right ventricular apex. We're moving this under uh, the electroanatomic mapping system without using any x-ray. And once the, the uh, young lady delivered, we could take an x-ray postnatally and see that the lead was in appropriate position in the apex of the right ventricle. We couldn't see this little loop of lead when we were putting it in, but that's just fine and she's doing great. What about defibrillators? Defibrillators, there's typically four routes of um, ways to place defibrillators in children that I think of. The standard transvenous approach that's used in older children and adults where it just goes through the vein uh, and down into the heart with a coil here in the heart. The old epicardial patches, which really hardly anybody uses anymore because these patches uh, 
crinkled and folded and crimped and, and, and broke. And so many investigators tried different approaches. About 20 years ago, we published the first subcutaneous pacemaker uh, defibrillator in a one-year-old child. And here you see the defibrillator in her belly and you see these subcutaneous leads just under the uh, skin in the left side of the chest. And that is sort of analogous to an external, an AED, where the energy goes from uh, side to side uh, to defibrillate the heart. And then um, more recently, a pericardial approach where the uh, defibrillator wire, this is a, a lead that's designed for use in the vein, a transvenous lead, and we just have the surgeons put it behind the heart, uh, and that works quite well. So more recently, uh, over the past uh, decade, a uh, company came up with a subcutaneous ICD that, it, at least in concept, was similar to our uh, idea of a subcutaneous ICD, although we just weren't smart enough to uh, patent it and, and commercialize it. Uh, but this is uh, very popular amongst adults. Uh, there's uh, uh, no wires in or on the heart, nothing in or on the heart. It's all subcutaneous. Uh, there's less flexion. And the system's placed using essentially anatomic landmarks, so you don't need x-ray for this uh, implantation. Here's one of the early uh, children that had this done, uh, a 10-year-old with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, 32 kilograms. And you can see this is a big device for a small child. You can see it bulging out on this lateral view, uh, but, but the incision's healing quite well, and uh, he's doing well. He's playing a video game with his brother, uh, complains of dizziness, loss of hearing, and then chest pain. And on review of his uh, defibrillator, you can see that he's in ventricular fibrillation and it takes the device a little while, 25.6 seconds to charge up to maximum energy and then uh, thankfully shock him back into sinus rhythm. This is one of the ICDs, subcutaneous ICDs we put in a young adult uh, who's had a Fontan procedure for single ventricle recoil. And this uh, example is on the right side of the uh, sternum. And here's the ICD you can see uh, in the left mid axillary line. They've come out with a second version that's new and improved. It's still uh, pretty big, uh, but it's smaller in terms of it's uh, about three millimeters thinner, uh, less volume, less weight, it lasts longer, and it can use their uh, remote monitoring system for uh, follow up. So it has all of those advantages, but it's still pretty big. And at least in, in our hands and many others, in children, we place it submuscular rather than subcutaneous. And so you can see from this sort of gory photo, there's a, a bit of dissection to get down there and, and a little bit of post-operative pain, more so than a standard smaller ICD implant. And centers around the world are coming up with ways to customize these because these still aren't made for children. Uh, and so in these examples from France, here they show a custom bending or bowing of the coil to allow it to fit in a smaller chest. And then on the other side, you see someone with dextrocardia. And so they put the subcutaneous ICD on the right side of the chest. But there's still issues with this. And so uh, we and others have been trying to make this a much less invasive technique. And here's an animal model. This is a little baby piglet, cute little piglet. And you can see on the left, the standard way that the surgeons have to open the chest to put the leads onto the outside of the heart. It's a lot of surgery just to do a little bit of sewing on the outside of the heart. And so our goal over the past really decade or more has been to do a percutaneous approach to just put a needle or a small straw size uh, port in to allow access to the heart. Here's our current version of the port. It's got little two channels to allow a pacing lead and a camera to go down. And this is what we see through that camera. We can see the needle, uh, just the needle going through the skin and you have excellent visualization. And so you can see the needle going into the pericardial space and being able to avoid critical structures like coronary arteries and other things and, and staying away from the dangerous things. And then that wire goes in behind the heart. A sheath gets inserted through, through that uh, uh, little hole in the pericardial space and uh, goes over. And then you can put an ICD or pacing lead through the sheath, fixate it to the heart. And you can see as the heart's beating, you can see the lead is stuck to it, is fixated to it. That's 
lung on the other side, on the right side that you see coming in and out. And then the sheath is removed. You see just a really small hole in the pericardial space that is not of any concern. And that's the whole procedure. Last, uh, uh, less than an hour and it's just done percutaneously. So that's really what we're aiming for. And our next iteration is modifying one of those leadless pacemakers to put a little uh, cap on it and a leadlet. And then the lead that goes into the pericardial space like this, and this is the whole system. So it doesn't have a big generator or anything like that. It's just this small uh, leadless pacemaker that's utilized as the generator. So you have to do a lot of customizing and uh, trying to come up with novel ideas to allow for pacing and defibrillation in children because there, there aren't devices uh, that you can just get out of the box and put in a child. So pediatric electrophysiologists have to be creative. If you think about it, this is how we watched TV about 60 years ago. And nowadays, we're watching it on our phones. There's quite a bit of miniaturization over that time period. Here's a defibrillator from the 1980s. It was big and bulky and couldn't be used in any children because of the size. And now our goal is to have a percutaneous port delivered device that can easily go through something the size of a straw. And I think that that's very feasible. So with that, we'll close and see if you have any questions. Thanks very much. Okay, so how about that? How amazing it is to see all those these innovations. You know, for so many, many years, we haven't been able to do much with the tiniest heart patients, and it looks like we're getting better and better at it. So we are lucky enough to have Dr. Charles Barul here today to answer some questions. Andrea, what questions do we have? And Dr. Barul, if you want to turn your video and mic on, that would be great. Come on, thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions that have come through on Facebook, um, but I'd like to start with the one, um, these smaller pacemakers, do they need to be replaced with larger pacemakers as the child grows? Uh, they're, all, they're all battery powered right now. And so they all will need to be replaced, hopefully as technology improves and miniaturization of devices continues to improve, uh, perhaps the replacement device might be even smaller and not necessarily a larger device. So uh, just because they get a small device to start doesn't mean they have to get a larger device. But yes, uh, the person ask, asking the question is correct that uh, the device will eventually have to be replaced. Uh, current battery technology, the, the devices last anywhere between five and 12 years, depending on how much you use the pacemaker. And as a follow-up, um, what is the smallest size that's available? And um, is there an ideal size that you're aiming for uh, to get the technology? There's no, we, we are aiming for, for the device that you saw right now, it's just in animal studies. So the, the, the piglets that I showed uh, are the only ones getting the, uh, the needle or straw delivered devices for now. We're waiting for a little bit more data that we're accumulating. Uh, we've talked to the FDA. Hopefully in a year or so, we'll be able to begin clinical testing in, in children. We would imagine that it would be three kilograms, which is about you know, six and a half pounds. So newborns uh, would be eligible for uh, this device if they need a pacemaker. Great. I do not see more questions. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Barul, and thank you to everyone at, at Children's National and DCU. <laughs> awesome. And we have another presenter from, from there a little later on. We appreciate you being here, Dr. Barul. Thanks so much, everybody, for your interest. <laughs>